Hello, everyone, and welcome to Introduction to R, Part 22, Probability Distributions. So in this lesson, we're going to discuss what probability distributions are and how to work with them in the R programming language. So many statistical tools and techniques used in data analysis and machine learning are based on probability. And probability is just a measurement of the likelihood that some event is going to occur that is on a scale from zero, which means an event never occurs, to one, which means the event always occurs. In working with data, the variables you have in the columns can be thought of as random variables, which are variables that vary due to chance. And a probability distribution tells us which values a random variable can take on and also which values are more likely than others. Now in the real world, we don't have access to the actual probability distributions that generate the data that we see. We don't really completely understand processes that generate data, so we use approximations to model what the underlying probability distributions might be. And there are many different precisely mathematically defined probability distributions in statistics that have different shapes and different properties that can be used to model different sorts of random events. So in this lesson, we're going to discuss what some of those well-defined probability distributions are and how to work with them in the R programming language. So I'll start by looking at the uniform distribution to learn the basics of probability distributions in R. So the uniform distribution is just a probability distribution where every single value is equally likely to occur. So I'll just start by generating a bunch of numbers using a uniform distribution and plotting it so, so we can see what a uniform distribution looks like. So we're just gonna generate a bunch of uniform data and plot it. It's gonna be on the range from zero to 10. So this is a density plot of the uniform data that we generated. Now, a probability density function is just a plot that shows the distribution of a random variable. It's a graphical representation of where certain values are more likely and other values are less likely. In this case, we are generating random data uniformly from zero to 10. So the density of a uniform distribution is flat because everything is equally likely. You can see our plot is actually not completely flat. It's a little bit wiggly because we actually generated this data randomly. So there is a little bit of natural variance in here that didn't make it completely flat. But what this means is every single value we could have generated from this range was equally likely to be selected. That's why it's it's pretty much just a flat distribution. And it should be noted that the volume or area under a probability curve like this always sums up to one. So since we generated from zero to 10 and the density is 0 0.1 and it's constant, if we multiply those together, which is essentially amounts to integrating this because it's just a square distribution would sum to one. But in general, if you check the area under a probability density curve, no matter what type of density function it is, it always has to sum to one. Now, every probability distribution in R comes with a special shorthand name to use to work with it. In the case of the uniform distribution, it's UNIF. And probability functions also have four different prefixes you can use to work with them in R. They are the R prefix, P, Q, and D. So I'll spend a bit of time going into what each of those means. The R prefix is what's used to generate random numbers from the specified distribution. So above, when we generated all the numbers we used to make that plot, we used the R unif function. That means we're generating random numbers from the uniform distribution. So we'll see another example of how to do that here. We're going to generate some more random data. We're using R unif. That means generate random numbers with a uniform distribution. N is the first argument, which is how many numbers you want to generate. Then you just have to enter the min and max which is the range of the uniform distribution. So here we're generating 10,000 more random values between zero and 10. 
And now the P prefix is used to determine the probability that an observation drawn from a distribution falls below a specified value. This is also known as the cumulative distribution function. So in essence, P gives you the area under the distribution's density curve that's to the left of a certain value along the x-axis. For example, in the uniform distribution we made above, there's a 25% chance that an observation will be in the range between 0 and 2.5, and a 75% chance that it would fall between 2.5 and 10. And we could confirm this exactly by using the p unif function. Let's do that. We're going to run p unif. The first argument is q, which is the quantile or cutoff value that you're checking at. In this case, we wanted to check at a cutoff of 2.5. And since we're checking for the same uniform distribution, we're going to again enter a min of 0 and a max of 10. And when we run that, as expected, the area to the left of 2.5 under this uniform distribution curve is is 0 0.25 which means we would have a 25 percent chance of having a number generated in that range so the q prefix when working with probability functions in r is kind of the inverse of p it returns the cutoff value or quantile associated with a given probability. For instance, if we wanted to know the cutoff value for which we had a 40% chance of drawing an observation below that value, we could use Q. So we'll show an example of using that. We're going to use Q unif, which means we're checking the quantile of the uniform distribution. In this case, we wanted to check a probability of 40%. So the first argument is that probability P is 0 0.4. Again, we're gonna use the same range for the distribution. So as we can see, the quantile that we would have to set to cut off the first 40% of observations in this case is four. And finally, the D prefix gives you the density or height of the density curve at any given point. Now, if you recall in the density curve we generated, the data was flat with a height of 0 0.1. So that means the density given by the D prefix on that distribution should be 0 0.1, regardless of where in the range we, we check. So we'll use the D unif function to check that. And we'll, we'll check a few different points just to confirm that it's gonna be the same everywhere. And we're gonna check X equals zero. We're also going to check x equals 5 and x equals 10. All of those should be 0 0.1 because it's just flat the, and it doesn't change throughout that range. But if we try to check a value outside of the distribution's range, it's going to show up as 0 because the chances that there's an 11, it's impossible because the range of the distribution only goes from 0 to 10. So we'll run that and we can see we did get 0 0.1 for all the ones that were within the range. Anything outside of the range is going to be 0. So before we start talking about other probability distributions and how to work with them in R, we're going to have a quick aside and talk about generating random numbers and setting the random seed. So anytime you need to generate random numbers of equal likelihood in R, you can use that R unif function that we looked at earlier. And this will generate real numbered or floating point value numbers within a specified range. If you wanted to not have decimal numbers and just have integers, you could do that just by rounding whatever the generated numbers are. So for instance, if we wanted to get random integers, we could use the floor function. So we'll just run this and check a table. They should be mostly the same, but of course there's some randomness involved. And this is a little bit of a roundabout way of generating integers. You can actually do this easier using the sample function. So I'll show how to do that here. With sample, you just pass in a range of or vector of values you want to generate randomly from. In this case, we're going to generate numbers between 1 and 10, but we could pass any vector in here. Then the second argument is size, which is the number that you want to sample and replace is whether you want to sample with replacement or not. We want to be able to generate values more than once. So we're gonna say sample with replacement, but if you put false, you're essentially taking any value you draw is not returned back into the pool of values you're drawing out of. So if we run this, it will essentially do the same thing as above, but a little bit nicer. So it's important to keep in mind when you're doing anything in a programming language, this isn't specific to R, 
but programming on computers in general, whenever you're doing something that involves randomness, you're generally dealing with what's known as pseudo randomness. So there's a random number generator that is generating numbers with some complicated formula, but computers are ultimately deterministic machines. So if the random number generator is initialized to the same initial state, you're going to get the exact same outcome for random numbers that you generate. So numbers generated by computers are not truly random unless you can actually sample some form of true randomness from the environment. So if you, for instance, had some kind of sensor that was able to sample some source of true environmental randomness, then you could use that to get true random numbers, but anything that's being programmatically generated is not truly random. And this is not necessarily a bad thing because it means you can precisely reproduce anything you do, even if it involves randomness. But if you want to reproduce something that involves randomness exactly, you need to store the value that was used to initialize the random number generator. So if you want to do that, you need to do what's known as setting the random seed, and that will initialize the random number generator to a given state before you run something. And every time you rerun it, if you set the same seed, the functions that involve randomness that you're, you're using will actually produce the exact same results. So we'll just show how to do that. In R, to set the random seed, you just use this set.seed, and then you pass in an arbitrary value into that function. And so you'll get different results depending on which number you pass in here. But as long as you use the same one every time, the results will be the same. So we're gonna generate these numbers twice, and we'll actually get the same numbers even though they're supposed to be random. Now if we went back and, for instance, changed this initial seed to something else, we ran it again, then the numbers would not be the same. So whenever you want to do reproducible data science and you're using randomness, then you can use this set.seed to accomplish that. So now I'll continue just by going over some of the different common probability distributions that you're likely to want to deal with in R and data science in general. We'll start with the normal distribution or Gaussian distribution. Now this is a continuous probability distribution characterized by a bell-shaped curve. Continuous just means it can take on any value within a given range, including decimal values, whereas a discrete probability distribution only takes on a fixed set of values. For instance, a coin flip would be an example of perhaps the most simple probability distribution you could think of, and it only takes on two values, either heads or tails, which you could say are like getting a zero or a one. In fact, in statistics, there's a special name for this type of distribution that is essentially a coin flip that can only take on one of two values with some probability. It is known as a Bernoulli random variable. The one caveat is with a coin, you're generally thinking that it's a 50-50 coin flip probability, whereas with a Bernoulli distribution, there's a parameter P, which determines the likelihood of getting a success or not. So with a Bernoulli random variable, you might have an unfair coin where you might have a probability of, say, 80% of getting a one, or you could say that's like a heads, and a probability of only 20% of getting the other value. But back to the normal distribution, it is a continuous distribution, which is defined by its center, which is the mean or average, and its spread, which is its standard deviation. Now the bulk of the normal distribution is centered around the mean. As a rule of thumb, approximately 68% of a normal distribution's data is within one standard deviation of the mean. 95% lies within two standard deviations, and about 99.7% lies within three standard deviations. So when people talk about something being within a certain number of standard deviations of the mean, these are good general numbers to remember because it'll give you some idea of the rarity of what they're talking about. Now the normal distribution is perhaps the most important distribution in all of statistics because as it turns out, many real world phenomenon like IQ test scores, human heights, and other things that just naturally occur in the real world follow a normal distribution. 
So as a result, it is often used to model random variables and many common statistical tests and operations make the assumption that distributions are normal. Now in R, the nickname for the normal distribution is norm. So the functions you can use with it are R norm, P norm, Q norm, and D norm. You just take those prefixes we learned about earlier and slap them onto the front of the name of the distribution. Let's generate some random data from a normal distribution using R norm and then plot it to get a sense of what the normal distribution looks like. So this is a density plot of the normal data that we generated. As you can see, most of the data lies within one standard deviation of the mean. And it also shows that values that are far away from the mean, which is at zero, perhaps at three or even four standard deviations are extremely rare because there's hardly any density under the curve here. Next, we'll go over the binomial distribution. Now the binomial distribution is a discrete probability distribution that models the outcome of a given number of Bernoulli random trials. So essentially it models the outcome of a given number of coin flips where the coin has some underlying probability of success P. The binomial distribution tells you how likely it is to get a given number of successes flipping the coin with a certain number of trials. For example, we could model flipping a fair coin 10 times with a binomial distribution where the number of trials n is set to 10 and the probability of success for each of the independent Bernoulli random trials is set to 0.5. And the distribution would then tell us how likely it is to get zero heads, one head, two heads, etc., all the way up to 10 heads. The nickname of the binomial distribution in R is binom, so we can use all of the prefixes we learned earlier with that. R binom, P binom, Q binom, and D binom. Let's use R binom to generate some random data from a binomial distribution. We'll have 10 trials with a probability of 0.5. So we're essentially modeling the distribution of flipping a fair coin 10 times. So I'll run this and create a histogram of the result to get an idea of what the distribution looks like. So as you might expect intuitively, if you were to flip a fair coin 10 times, the most likely outcome is that you'd get five successes or five heads. And it's very unlikely that you'd get, say, all heads, which would be 10 successes, or zero heads, which would mean you got all tails. In this case, the distribution in the histogram is symmetric because we had equal chances of getting either result. But if we changed the value of P, which is the probability of getting a success on any given trial, this would not be symmetric anymore. So let's generate some new data, but let's use a biased coin where the probability of success is actually 80% instead of 50% and see how it changes this distribution. So I'm just going to generate that extra data and run another histogram. And as you can see this time, when the probability of success is 80%, the most common outcome is that you get eight heads out of 10 flips. But now getting 10 heads is actually quite common, and the chances of getting no heads at all is extremely low. Next, we'll go over the geometric and exponential distributions. Now, the geometric and exponential distributions model the time it takes for some event to occur. The geometric distribution is discrete, and models the number of trials it takes to achieve a success on some repeated experiment with some given probability of success. For instance, you could model the amount of trials it would take to flip heads on a fair coin if you repeatedly flip it. And the exponential distribution is essentially the continuous analog of the geometric distribution. It models the amount of time it would take for some event to occur, given some specified occurrence rate. The R name for the geometric distribution is geom. So let's use that to generate some random geometric data and model the number of trials it takes to get a success when flipping a fair coin. So to do that, we're going to use R geom, and then we're going to set the probability to 0.5, so it's a fair coin. So let's run that, and we see that out of a million trials, about half of the time, 500,000, it only takes one flip to get a heads. That makes sense. Then 
25% of the time, essentially, it takes two flips, etc. So we actually had one time where it took 23 flips before we got a heads, but that is extremely unlikely because that only happened one out of a million trials. So let's do the same thing for the exponential function. In R, the name for the exponential distribution is exp. We actually used this in past lessons to generate some skewed data. So let's use it again to generate some random numbers here. We're going to use Rx to do that. And the rate indicates how often a success or arrival occurs per unit of time. So here we're setting the rate equal to one, which means we're expecting one success or arrival per unit of time. Which means, for instance, if we were using this to try to model, say, arrivals of patients at a hospital, we'd have one patient arriving per hour. We're just going to run this to generate the data, and then this next bit is going to make a plot looking at the distribution of the data. As you can see, with an average arrival time of one, most of the time a success occurs in less than one unit of time. You can see that 63% of the time it takes less than one for an arrival to occur. Occasionally, in this long tail, it takes much longer for a success to occur. And finally, we are going to discuss the Poisson distribution. The Poisson distribution models the probability of seeing a certain number of successes within a certain time interval where the time it takes for the next success to occur is modeled by an exponential distribution. So when we were looking at the exponential distribution, we were talking about, say, how long it takes for the next patient to arrive at a hospital if the average arrival time was an hour. The Poisson distribution, on the other hand, would tell us things like how often we would have zero arrivals during the first hour. How often would we have only one patient arriving within the first hour? How often would we have, say, 10 patients and having an unexpected busy hour? In R, the nickname for the Poisson distribution is poise. So let's use that with our R prefix to generate some random Poisson distributed data and get a sense of what the distribution can look like. We'll be using an arrival rate or lambda of one. The table here shows that with an arrival rate of one, more often than not, we're only going to see zero, one, or two arrivals within a given time period, but sometimes in rare cases, you do get seven, eight, even nine arrivals. So while it's not likely, businesses would still have to account for the possibility of getting a rush of people that's more than expected. And if we were to set a higher arrival rate, so we'll do a arrival rate or lambda of 10 this time, it's actually not very likely to have zero arrivals anymore, but we're far more likely to have many arrivals. If we plot a histogram of the distribution, it actually looks a lot more like a normal distribution than it does like the exponential distribution. This concludes our lesson on the basics of probability and probability distributions in R. Now, it's impossible to cover all the different probability distributions that are out there in one lesson. I tried to cover some of the more common ones that you can work with directly using base R functions. The most important things to know is that a lot of common probability distributions you can work with using base R. And it's also good to remember the different prefixes for the distributions and what they do. Namely, the R prefix allows you to generate random numbers from a distribution. The D prefix allows you to check the density of a probability distribution at a given point. And the P prefix lets you check the probability or the amount of data that lies below a certain cutoff or a quantile value. The Q prefix is the inverse of that, so it finds the quantile or cutoff value for cutting off a given amount of data under the probability distribution curve. In the next lesson, we'll continue our exploration of statistics in R with a lesson on confidence intervals and point estimates. So see you next time.